Welcome back to the lecture series on GPU architectures and programming. So, if you remember in the last lecture, we were discussing thread coarsening as a possible optimization for GPU programs and uh, in a short summary, we, we just discussed that uh, what are the good and bad things of coarsening and uh, we just try to motivate why beyond a point coarsening threads too much may not be of help. And in that regard, we define, we are trying to define rather that what is the notion of coarsening factor. So, essentially uh, the fa by factor, I mean that uh, how much work I am going to allocate per thread over and above a baseline implementation. So, in that way a coarsening factor is the number of times I am going to replicate the body of a thread. That means, the number of times I am increasing the per thread activity uh, with respect to a baseline implementation. And, uh, uh, what, what is interesting is to figure out what is the best performance, what is the coarsening factor that gives the best performing performance depending on the program and on the hardware, right. So, uh, it is not something constant, it very much is a, is a function of what program is under consideration and what is the target GPU. And uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, I mean it is easy to understand why that would happen because as we have discussed earlier that whether coarsening is going to help beyond a point or not depends on the amount of architectural resources that are available in the hardware. And uh, uh, up to some point uh, doing coarsening is fine that you are increasing part thread activity without decreasing the occupancy of the hardware. At some point you are going to hurt the occupancy of the hardware, but still coarsening may be good because you are utilizing the hardware resources more efficiently because each coarsened thread is making more efficient use of the hardware. But beyond that point, it may happen that the occupancy reduces so much that you lose out on the effective parallelism over the lifetime of the program. And uh, whatever is the best coarsening factor is, uh, I mean, deciding that statically is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, is one way that you can do a static program analysis to figure out a, a possible coarsening factor. It may not be the best, but you can figure out a possible coarsening factor. And uh, also, the other way would be that you we try different coarsening factors and it is it is really an intricate problem because the architecture will have lot of parameters, the program can have lot of dependencies. So, figuring out the perfect coarsening factor, you can try doing that using a static analysis and you can uh, without any guarantee that it is basically the best coarsening factor. The alternative can be that you try out different possible coarsening factors, profile each of the implementations, different coarsened implementations in the architecture, profile them, profile each of the coarsening factors for multiple possible input runs and uh, create a, create some speed up analysis and figure figure out what is what is working best for you. Now, the static analysis uh, based uh, methods which can give you a good coarsening factor would be sound ones. That means, they would give you, they will say that well this coarsening is feasible to implement without hurting the, hurting the functional equivalence of the program. But it may not be able to say that whether that indeed is the best possible coarsening or not. So, <clears throat> the different types of coarsening, uh, just like we discuss different types of uh, techniques of fusion, like what are the different possible ways in which you can implement fusion among GPU kernels. Similar to that, there are different possible ways in which you can coarsen a GPU kernel and uh, basically you have to increase the per thread activity. <clears throat> now, that can be done at the thread level or at the block level. So, when we say that you are doing a thread level coarsening, that means increased granularity within a single block of thread. So, essentially you are uh, coarsening threads by giving them more activity per thread, but those are all activities inside a single thread block. The other could be that you do block level coarsening that is you increase the granularity of coarsening across multiple blocks. That means, when you thicken or coarsen a thread, you give it more activity not from the original block of thread, but more activity from other blocks of thread. I hope this is clear, let me just reiterate. So, when I do thread, thread level coarsening, I will coarsen a thread by giving it more activity, but that activity was originally inside this specific thread block, inside who, which I am talking about the threads. When I say block level coarsening, that means I am coarsening each of the threads inside the thread block by giving them extra activity, which is not the activity of the original thread block, but from some other thread block. So, let us first discuss thread level coarsening in detail. 
So, when I am applying the coarsening, I am applying it at the level of individual threads and so essentially I am combining two or more threads from the same block activities of two or more threads I am delegating it to one thread inside the block. So, each thread block now performs the same amount of work because I have not delegated work from other thread blocks to threads inside this thread block. Uh, since I have not done that, so now each thread block performs the same amount of work, but it is able to achieve that with coarsened threads which are fewer in number. So, I am, I am now decreasing the threads per block uh, while doing the same functionality of the thread block. Okay? Uh, but when we do this, each, each of these streaming multiprocessors have their limitations as we have discussed earlier in terms of the registers, the total register file size inside the SM, that amount of shared memory inside this and concurrently runnable thread blocks like how many concurrent thread contexts that SM can hold. Right? So, these are the three limiting factors and uh, that, re that actually limits the total amount of uh, uh, so uh, total, uh, total number of effective threads that will really be launched in the SM after I thicken or coarsen the threads. Just to make the point clear, so every SM has a <coughs> upper bound on the total number of concurrently runnable thread blocks. Right? Now, it also has an upper bound on the size of the register and the shared memory. So, when I coarsen the threads, I increase the per thread demand of registers and shared memory. So, due to that the SM may be also getting further limited in terms of the actual thread blocks that it can run concurrently and uh, these hardware constraints will actually I mean this is something we have already discussed these hardware constraints will actually decide on how many threads I can really run that will affect the occupancy which in turn will uh, give the bound on how much really I should apply the amount of thread level coarsening. So, <coughs> the next important thing is what is the stride length uh, across which I should do the coarsening. Right? So, uh, 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 so, this acts, uh, acts as an offset between the IDs of threads that are to be combined. So, when I am combining two threads, what should be the offset between them? Right? Now, the maximum stride when I allow, so first of all we are still talking about thread level coarsening. But when I am coarsening threads, it is not necessary that I, I, uh, I just coarsen TID with the amount of activities for the original TID and the TID plus 1, but rather I, can, I am trying to coarsen the thread with TID, uh, the thread ID TID with uh, activities of original threads with uh, thread IDs being TID and TID plus S, where S is a stride length. Right? So, uh, this amount of this stride length uh, can have some limits. First of all, what should be the maximum stride length? It should be less than the number of threads per block in the dimension where the coarsening is applied divided by the coarsening factor. So, let us try and understand what it means. So, let us consider that this is the total thread, uh, thread, thread, diamond, uh, thread arrangement and I am using a coarsening factor c equal to 2. right? So, effectively I am going to use this many threads, right? I mean uh, the half of this number of threads. Okay? So, uh, maybe, uh, yeah. So, let us say I am going to use half of this number of threads and I am doing the coarsening in this dimension. And uh, so, when I am choosing the stride length, so the number of threads per block in this dimension. Uh, let it be some x, right? So divide uh, by two, right? So that would be the maximum number of threads, thread IDs in this dimension in the coarsened kernel, right? So the maximum stride length for the threads has to be less than this, right? That is the limiting factor. Why? Because uh, <coughs> uh, of course, uh, if it goes beyond this. Then I have a problem because the thread sitting at the boundary of uh, this uh, coarsen coarsening boundary, they uh, those thread IDs plus the stride value would should be on the original thread block boundary, right? So, uh, I, if you just consider the number of threads per block in any of any specific dimension in which we are applying the coarsening, so let's say this is the dimension we are applying the coarsening, you divide it by the coarsening factor. So, that would give you the total arrangement of threads that would be there in the coarsened kernel. Now, 
when I am talking about the stride length, I hope this is clear, the stride length has to be limited uh, by the original dimension in that uh, in that uh, original thread spur block number in that dimension divided by the coarsening factor. Uh, be because uh, if I consider a stride length you know, which is uh, uh, greater than this, then what happens is the threads uh, which are the TID sitting in this boundary, those plus the stride length would go beyond uh, the thread dimension in this uh, uh, in, in the original arrangement of the data right so the uh, maximum stride length will be limited by this equation but uh, at the same time what should be the minimum stride length now uh, tr just uh, to make sure uh, that uh, we Want, do not want to disturb the original memory behavior of the program, right? So uh, uh, let's say originally uh, I had a few TIDs uh, which are uh, doing access of the of some data sequentially, so that when these uh, thread IDs uh, they are they, they get packed inside a warp. perform uh, coalesced access of the data from this memory, I do not want to disturb this behavior. right? So, let us understand that if I make one thread, each of the threads in this warp, if I am trying to coarsen them by making this thread ID to the job of accessing this thread ID followed by the next, let us say, again the other thread ID uh, followed by the next uh, and uh, so on and so forth then uh, I, I may possibly lose out on the uh, memory coalescing. So, when I am trying to coarsen each of the threads, I would like to have the minimum stri stride length to be greater than the warp size, so that whatever is the behavior of the threads inside the warp, they do not lose out on their coalesced memory accesses, but rather when the thread does its uh, coarsened extractivity, it belongs to uh, another separate coalesced global memory transaction. So, those would belong to another separate global memory transaction. like this. So, this is the original transaction of the threads. This other set of transactions were supposed to be, let us say this is one transaction. This other transaction, I do not want to disturb this nice behavior. So, if I, if I just uh, make the strides greater than the warp size, then essentially I am not disturbing the original memory coalescing. Uh, whereas, uh, if I do something like uh, <coughs> I am accessing if for each thread ID I am accessing consecutive locations, uh, that does not make real sense, right? because uh, then uh, uh, in many cases it may happen that the original memory coalescing behavior which was nicely distributed across the threads that may get into a problem. So, I hope with some uh, examples you can actually uh, work, work this out that why we would like to keep the stride length greater than the warp size. So, with this as a motivation, let us try to look at a coarsened, vers vers uh, coarsened version of our reduction kernel. In fact, uh, if you remember that uh, in a reduction kernel, uh, whenever we are trying to do the access, we, we are trying to uh, ensure that the global memory transactions are nicely coalesced and even the shared memory reads are nicely coalesced right? without any kind of shared memory bank conflict. So, <coughs> we, we, let us first go through this example. Here, uh, we are trying to use a thread coarsening factor of 2 with the stride as 32, which is uh, equal to the warp size. Now, this coarsening factor is dictating how many replicas of the local thread ID and global thread ID will be in the program. right? So, <coughs> I hope this is clear. So, 
we have to replicate this local and global thread IDs in the program, right. Uh, so, uh, since we have chosen a coarsening factor of 2, uh, we need 2 instances of local thread IDs to access 2 consecutive data values, two, 2 not con 2 possible data values for a given global thread ID, right. So, let this T ID be the local thread IDs and I is the global thread IDs, right. So, we will need 2 instances of both of them here. So, we compute this T i d 0 and T i d 1, right. So, that would actually uh, give us this uh, different uh, local thread i d s. As you can see that the local thread, this is the T i d 0 is a standard local thread i d inside the block and we know this because uh, we are just uh, calculating the offset, right. So, we are just uh, uh, assuming that it is all in the, x, uh, we, are, we are coarsening in the x dimension here, right since we are coarsening in the x dimension with this calculation we are finding out the offset in the local thread id and then we are do, uh, since we are choosing a stride of 32 so that would give me the uh, second location from where i will try to do the thread level activity and then i compute i0 and i1 which tell me what is the global thread id corresponding to this local thread ids right so it's just that i know already what is the block, right. So, with that uh, block id and all that I just will add T i d 0 and T i d 1. Observe this multiplication factor of 2 in terms of the block dimension, because now uh, the thing is I am going to access the corresponding data points and I am launching half of the threads. So, that re that means that I am going to uh, have a half a half value of effective block dimension while defining the thread blocks. So, in order to get the suitable access patterns for the corresponding uh, locations in the data, I will have this uh, multiplication factor by 2 here in the blocks, right. So, with this we are able to compute the I 0 and I 1, the positions for which I am going to do the global memory accesses for the respective data points. Now, uh, so uh, this is basically the reduction kernel with thread coarsening. So, what we are trying to do is that first uh, each of these uh, thread id uh, th th this uh, this uh, global memory locations i0 and i1 we are just checking whether they are valid locations for this kernel and then we are bringing them into the shared memory and once we bring them into the shared memory we are doing the usual reduction step right <coughs> now uh, so as you can see this is the loop for the usual reduction step like we have discussed earlier right now just observe one simple thing like just like we have done it here, since we have a coarsening factor of 2. So, we will have half of the original number of threads in the x dimension. So, that is why wherever I have block dimension is getting multiplied by 2, right. Similarly, here it is getting multiplied by 2. This divide by 2 is the original code semantics for the reduction kernel, right. And then inside we have the original code uh, that you just do a addition in shared memory with a stride of s. But now we are doing it for uh, so this s is basically uh, this uh, strides of which of the for loop in reduction, whereas our choice of stride for coarsening is 32, which is already hard coded here, right? Just to avoid the confusion, so this s is the effective strides get divided getting divided by two in each iteration of the standard reduction kernel, right? Inside the for loop, instead of having one if statement of a standard reduction kernel we have this is a this is a coarsened kernel. So, we have two f statements for two different locations right. <coughs> that is why we have this comment that in the for loop the s data is updated by both the TIDs by both TID 0 and TID 1 right. And uh, when uh, we do the write uh, <coughs> only one of these can be 0 right. Uh, so, uh, uh, so the condition for the second the other will not never be true right. So, whichever is 0 for that we will be doing the output data calculation right. I mean loading back to the global data. So, with this uh, we have an example of coarsening by 2 for the standard reduction kernel. Now, uh, let us just have a discussion on uh, block level coarsening. So, as we saw in thread level coarsening, we were doing the coarsening inside the same block and while coarsening we are making a choice of the stride 
the stride should be such that inside the coarsened kernel the threads do not access locations beyond the thread block size reduced thread block size so it was the original block dimension in that uh, coarsening di dimension divided by the coarsening factor that was the maximum possible stride and uh, the minimum stride that was uh, definitely greater than the uh, warp size so that any original memory access coalescing, uh, coalescing uh, that the pattern that was a good part of the original kernel should never get uh, disturbed uh, that is why we were not uh, we are always choosing a stride which was uh, greater than the stride length. Now <coughs> coming to the other part which is uh, block level coarsening now we are uh, I mean uh, what, we, what we are really going to do is that uh, we will essentially combine multiple thread blocks to one block that means when I coarsen a thread the thread should be doing its original activity additionally it will be doing activity from some other thread from another block right. So, uh, effectively in the original thread level coarsening what was happening is the thread number of threads per block was getting reduced due to the coarsened threads, but here what will happen is the number of threads per block will remain unchanged, but we will have the number of effective number of blocks getting reduced right. So, each block still has to handle an increased workload uh, as you can see in the original case in the thread level coarsening uh, the per block activity remains same number of threads per block reduced threads per block got coarsened with original uh, thread original thread blocks activities. Here the thread block sizes remain same the number of total number of blocks reduces by the coarsening factor since the thread block sizes remain same and the threads gets coarsened. So, each block handles the increased workload. Coming to resource requirements per block in terms of uh, register and shared memory usage such resource requirements will typically increase. So, when we talk about resource requirements per block then in terms of registers and shared memory usage these requir requirements typically increase. So, what is the choice of stride length when we are talking about block level coarsening? So, now we are going to uh, discuss uh, the stride in terms of blocks. This acts as an offset between the IDs of blocks that are to be merged, right? Uh, I, as you can understand, now we are talking about bringing activities from different blocks together. So, if I am trying to draw a picture, originally when I was doing thread level coarsening, so, if this was the original block, I was I was kind of uh, uh, coarsening threads inside the block by let us say this was your original works for the threads. So, now when I coarsen the thread, I am delegating this thread its original activity along with the activity here at a stride length, right. So, by delegating activities at a stride length together to the original thread we were coarsening and creating smaller thread blocks right. But now when we are doing block level coarsening so let us say I have a thread block let us say this is one thread block thread block 1 this is thread block 2 like that. So, when I coarsen I coarsen one thread here with activities from threads in the other block right. Now, here when I do this my stride length s is 1. Now, this is not general right. So, suppose so here I am not drawing the threads, but I am drawing thread blocks right. So, this is one thread block this is a thread level coarsening.
So, suppose these are four thread blocks and I pick up a thread from here and I give it activity of the its original activity and some activity from the thread here. And uh, similarly, for other threads here getting the activities from this that has block 3, 3 since they are sitting at a distance of 2. So, here the definition of stride length is the stride across blocks, right. So, uh, with this uh, we can just say that the maximum stride length uh, can be discussed simil in a similar way, but now at the grid level, right. So, uh, if I am coarsening in a specific dimension, so then the maximum stride length will be limited by the number of blocks in the dimension in which coarsening is applied divided by the coarsening factor. So, just observe the difference between thread level and block level coarsening. So, when we are doing thread level coarsening, the maximum stride length was limited by number of threads in the dimension of the thread block where coarsening was applied divided by the coarsening factor of the thread block. In this case, the maximum stride length is less than or equal to the number of thread blocks in the dimension, number of thread blocks inside the grid of the kernel in that dimension where coarsening is applied divided by the coarsening factor, right. So, if I say that in this dimension I am applying and uh, the coarsening factor is 2, so I will be merging this, right. And so, I am, uh, so let us say there are 4 thread blocks here uh, and uh, the coarsening factor is 2. So, maximum stride length is less than equal to 2 and when I operate with s equal to 2, I am operating at the maximum stride length possible, right. And then we have the idea of minimum stride length. Now, of course, uh, that would be 1 because I the, by definition of block level coarsening, I have to pick up threads, thread activity from uh, another block, the nearest would be the next block. So, the stride is greater than or equal to 1. Now, since uh, the blocks we are now using the using the thread blocks for uh, different thread blocks for selecting threads. So, the stride will have no influence on memory coalescing as the memory access pattern within the blocks are or whatever is the original memory access pattern inside the block that is always preserved. I mean it is quite easy to understand because when you are forming warps, you are forming warps with threads from inside a block, right. And since you are coarsening across blocks, the original warps, they are packing their memory access patterns, their memory coalescing, whatever is there in as a warp level activity, the, as a warp level coalescing uh, trans, uh, due to global memory transactions, uh, they do not really change. So, let us take an example of uh, block level coarsening. So, here your local thread IDs uh, remain unchanged. The coarsening factor dictates how many replicas of the global thread ID will be there in the program. So, uh, observe the difference earlier you replicated the global local thread IDs and then you actually replicated the uh, global thread IDs, but now your local thread ID is same you are using the, the reason the local thread ID is same you, you because is that the local thread ID gives you a specific offset inside the block, right. Earlier you were trying to access two different thread level activity inside a single block. So, that would mean different possible offsets inside the single block. So, you had computed two different local thread IDs and of course, their corresponding global thread IDs. But now your offset will remain same, but for the same offset you will be accessing different blocks. So, for the same offset you are computing two different global thread IDs using two different blocks. Considering here that the stride is 1 and the coarsening factor is 2, since the coarsening factor is 2 in the x dimension, so you are multiplying block ID x, block dim x, uh, block, the block dimension x by 2 and then you are going to take another thread at the same offset from the adjoining block. So, uh, the original uh, block dimension by 2 ti times 2 times block ID x, that same thing here you are uh, you are applying to the next block. So, twice of block ID x in that dimension plus 1, right, the adjoining block. In that block you go to the thread ID with the same offset.
So, since we are operating at one stride length, so the thread should be separated by one block dimension dot x value, right. So, uh, maybe with this introduction to the block level questioning example, we will end this lecture and in the next lecture, we will go into further details. Thank you.